get started. Uh, welcome everybody. This is our virtual roundtable webinar. We'll be focusing on summer heat's impact on processing natural gas. So thank you for joining us today. Let's get this thing started. To stay in the know, um, if something happens, you have a meeting pop up, kid walks in, internet goes down, uh, we will be uploading this video to our YouTube channel and it's gonna be embedded onto our website as well. So if you got specific questions, please reach out to us um, that you want the video so we can just ship you a link or you will see it within the next week or so on our YouTube channel. Uh, so my name is Cameron Croft. I'm CEO of Croft Production Systems. Uh, we are putting this webinar together to help share uh, our knowledge, our education to our clients, uh, to other people in the industry. So that's the reason I brought Chris Smithson, our Director of Engineering, he's been with us for over 10 years. He's in charge and gets blamed for everything that goes wrong with crop production systems. Uh, so Director of Engineering, Chris, will be joining us. Uh, and then Eric Gorka is our service manager. He runs the service team. Uh, we operate in 14 states, so he has a lot of things that work with him and against him at times, but I appreciate uh, Gorka joining us today going through. Uh, so the topic highlights, we really wanted to focus on the, what our clients were asking for, so our frequently asked questions over the years, so especially when it comes to the summer heat. So we're focusing on impact on dehydration, heat impact on liquid recovery, and BTU reduction, uh, the impact on compressors, aiming plants, instrumentation lines, and the color metric tubes. So we'll be going through that today. Um, kind of going through tips and tricks and what we've seen in the past and hopefully be sharing some uh, gap of knowledge that y'all might not have. Uh, so this is a round table structure. So please feel free at any time. We're gonna be going through uh, each of these topics and trying, I'm gonna try to get them to stay on schedule. But if you have any questions, please do not be afraid to write either in the question and answer box or in the chat function. So that way we can get um, those questions answered for you. This is a virtual round table. So we, our whole point of this is to actually engage. All right, so we're kicking off in today's meeting, the heat impact on processing um, natural gas. So the focus on this one is heat. So the biggest thing that everyone focuses on first. So Chris, if you can kick us off on character characteristics of saturation. So yeah, with heat comes an increase in water content. And that, that's usually the, a big thing that, that affects a lot of the different production issues that, that we see. And so the, the two main characteristics of water saturation for natural gas is pressure and temperature. And so as the temperature goes up or the pressure goes down, that water can physically hold more gas or, or the gas can hold more water. So we, um, we always prefer higher pressures, um, lower temperatures to help that out, especially with dehydration applications. Um, the, uh, the lower the temperature, the less the dehy has to work. Um, but a good rule of thumb is that between, uh, for a 20 degree increase in temperature at the same pressure, you can double the water content of the natural gas. So um, it starts, it's not quite 20 degrees as you get above 100. Um, but basically, if you're going from 80 to 100 degrees, you're doubling the water content, which can double the amount of work that um, that dehydrator has to do. Um, and so that, that's a big that can be a big impact on the actual dehydration capability and um, what your equipment can can possibly be able to do. But that's a, a really good rule of thumb. Um, 20 degree increase in temperature or decrease in temperature either doubles or halves the amount of water in that gas. All right. So. If you double the amount of water, what does that have to do with uh, dehydration? So for a glycol dehydrator, if you're doubling the water content, that means you have to double your circulation rate to make up for that. Um, hopefully your tower is, uh, is big enough. Um, a six tray tower may not be able to, uh, to handle that, that absorption. Um, if, if you're at 100 degrees and you're going to 120, um, usually that's like a more called for like an eight tray tower or if you've got a packed tower and you need a taller one. 
Um, but the circulation rate is the, the main thing. If you increase your circulation rate, if you double your circulation rate, then you're mm -hmm. doubling the, uh, you're cutting in half the life of your filters. So if you're changing them every month, then now you're changing them every two weeks. Um, you're also doubling your fuel gas usage. You're doubling the, um, the amount that the pumps have to stroke, um, which is going to, you know, increase wear and tear. So you're, you're really, uh, shortening the life of, of your dehydrator, the harder that you're running it and increasing cost and consumption. Well, from the Gorka, I mean, your service guys have to handle this type of equipment all the time. So, I mean, if you're doubling the amount of pump circulation, I mean, what do you do to pre prepare your team to go out there and do better preventative maintenance? Right. Well, that's a, like, like Chris uh, mentioned, every, everything works harder. It, when the gas is hotter, you know, your, your pumps are stroking more. The more strokes, the more, you know, wear and tear that is going to be on the pump. So you have to be aware of, you know, like Chris said, and you might be going once a month changing filters where you kind of got to be aware that, uh, you know, hey, the filters might get dirty or faster. So you always kind of uh, got to be checking in pretty much on the plant. Uh, one of our plants in South Texas, our, our tech goes down there once a week uh, and checks and make sure everything is working properly. Nothing, you know, had hiccup or anything like that. Um, you got to check your, your instrumentation, make sure it's working uh, 100%, you know. Uh, for like our, uh, our PDS units, uh, you know, it's going to be pulling more, more water enters the system. That means it's going to be pulling more water. That means, you know, more, uh, it is going to accumulate more at the bottom. It needs to be dumping uh, more frequently. So you got to make sure your instrumentation is always uh, running properly. There's no hiccups there. That's just going to lead to more, more issues if, if that's not running properly. Um, but definitely in the summer times, the, uh, the service team is very aware, you know, to, you know, dot all the I's and cross the T's and make sure, you know, it's a hundred percent fully, uh, fully working properly before they leave each location. Yeah. And for our PDS system, since they have that consumable desiccant that's doing the dehydration, um, we, we sell more Enviro dry in the summer than we do in the mm -hmm. winter, just because the average gas temperature is higher mm -hmm. for our clients, um, especially in South Texas, someone through East Texas. Um, so that, you know, if, if there's any cooling that, that can be done, um, that can definitely, it's a direct cost savings uh, if you're using our PDS system. Um, for glycol units, it really is just more of a, uh, of a work um, that's having to happen. Um, mm -hmm. But that's for heating. On the opposite side of that, we have cooling. So if the gas is cooling when it's coming into the DHI, then you have a risk of if you have very rich gas, actual condensate fallout running into the unit. So if you're coming off of a compressor at 120 degrees and it's only you know a nice warm day of 95, and that gas is cooling as it's coming to you, you may have a liquid fallout that's going to slam into your dehydration unit. Now, you should have good separation ahead of it, but that's not always the case, um, especially is oversized stuff. Maybe you have oversized piping, stuff builds up in low spots, and then you slug into a contact tower. The, uh, the inlet set on the bottom of the tower should be able to handle that, but if it's not able to or not effectively separating it, then you're getting a lot of hydrocarbons into your contact tower, and then that's hopefully going to be separated out in your three-phase separator if you have one. Um, but you know, again, that oil and your glycol, you know, that's, that's what the separator is for, but you're going to increase the usage of your carbon filter because some of that's going to sneak by through the separator then the, the carbon filter is not going to be able to absorb the contaminants going to cause foaming. And then you have other problems that you're going to have to deal with. Um, but yeah, cooling is a big thing to look out for um, making sure you have adequate separation after any sort of cooling or just putting in a cooler so that you can force the cooling to happen with the separation so that you're not relying on your pipeline to cool it down. And, you know, however X many feet of, of that and then cooling happens in places where it's not supposed to. So one of the questions uh, that we had from one of our clients is uh, right now, what are they supposed to do to assess or prepare for their, their TG systems uh, before the summer months? Like what are some top five things that y'all would look out for right now? So filters um, and stock. <laughs> filters and stock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would definitely be looking at, you know, can you, you know, is your spare pump working? Because if you're going to be turning your pump up, you're going to start, you know, yeah. maybe you find out that as soon as you go to turn those knobs, the thing doesn't want to go any faster. Um, I mean, I would definitely look at, you know, is your, if you have a compressor or, you, you know, is, is there anything that you can do to, you know, open those louvers? If we start to get out, the fall and spring season is always the more awkward time because you, temperatures may still drop low enough to where you don't necessarily want, um, you know, the full, full open on the, on your coolers. 
um, if, you, if they're manually operated. So that, that can be a little tricky because then you get excessive temperatures in the heat of the day. Um, but yeah, if there's any, any cooling that you can potentially do uh, ahead of you know, the summer months, it's always a, a good idea to look into. I guess uh, you, kept, you kept on saying proper separation before the contact tower. So I guess making sure the liquid level controllers, dump valves, those things are being operation before that hits into the tower. Yeah, making sure your dump valve and level controller operate on the um, the integral separator on the bottom of your tower, if you have yeah. one. Um, if you got a coalescing filter, maybe it's a good time to change your filters. Um, as the cooling happens and the hydrocarbons condense out, um, you can get like a fog going through there, which is what mist eliminator is made for. Um, but if your coalescing filter maybe, you know, hasn't been changed in a year, year and a half, maybe it's imploded um, and it's just not doing what it's supposed to anymore, it may be a good time to, to change that out because it may start seeing a little more uh, work to have to do. Well, uh, we'll move on to the next one, but you see my son on this one. Yeah, he's our new worker. <laughs> he's already telling me what to do. So I think he's going to be, I think he's going to work out just fine in the oil and gas. <laughs> Pumps about 10 times his weight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So uh, the reason why we were focusing on amine plants right after uh, TG system or dehydration is because there's a lot of functionality that's the same, but there is some tips and tricks on amine plants that are different. So Chris, can you kick us off on, um, I guess, an amine plant? What is it used for and why the functionality is the same? Yeah, so it, it's similar pieces to a glycol system, contact tower regeneration. So the, the same inlet conditions kind of apply. Um, you know, we, if you're cooling, you don't want to slug into an amine plant um, with, with liquids. Uh, amine plants are more temperamental than glycol systems, so you definitely don't want to introduce a bunch of liquid, um, especially because, uh, because the amine is a water oil or a water amine mix. Um, you know, it's, it's a little more finicky if you're getting the wrong kind of water in there. You get a bunch of brine water in there, then you have salt in the system. Um, it can't really quite separate it um, as well. And so you're going to, it's, the impurities make more of a difference on, on the amine plant. So if you have a bunch of cooling happening, um, especially cooling inside the tower, where it's actually condensing inside the tower, that can be very problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the same issues that you'd have with the glycol system. Um, the big difference with an amine plant is that when you absorb the CO2 or H2S, you have a heat of reaction in the tower of the, uh, of the amine plant. So the gas normally increases temperature as it's absorbing, um, getting the CO2 or H2S absorbed out of it. So your outlet temperature is normally a lot hotter than your inlet temperature. Now what this is doing is because you're coming in probably, you know, most likely 100% saturated into it because you're going to be before dehydration, then you're going to start sucking water out of the amine, which means you're going to have to make up more water into your plant. Now, some smaller plants, they don't have an after cooler and a separator to try to recover that water. Um, so the hotter the gas coming in, then the hotter the, uh, the gas coming out, the more water that it can pull out. So if you're coming out at 100 degrees versus 120, that's double the water content. So if you can cool the gas coming in, where your heat of reaction, you're only getting up to 100 versus 120 or versus 140, then you're going to have a lot less water losses the cooler that outlet is even after that heat of reaction. So, you know, pre-cooling into the amine plant is, is always good. If the amine gets too hot anyway, then it's just, it'll stop absorbing. Um, if, if you're like, you're after a compressor and you're coming in at like 130 and then um, the heat of reaction is getting up to like 140, 150, it'll just stop absorbing CO2. Um, so pre-cooling, it can definitely help to, to get out some of the hydrocarbons and, you know, anything that may condense out of there. Um, but I'm sure Gorka can definitely speak to, um, you know, water losses on the Amy plant. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, it, you don't notice the scent until you actually get out there and you're like, well, well you wear it on my water go. It, it's everything seems to be running fine. And then you go and check your water tank and your water tank is low and you're like, oh boy, you know, that's something you got to keep out for. Um, also like with the condenser, it's hotter outside. And so, you know, the condenser is not condensing, changing the steam, uh, from the reboiler to the reflux, it's not condensing it down to water. So you're, you're losing some, you know, out of your, uh, your back pressure valve up top and whatnot. So that's some of the water, uh, that you lose mm -hmm. also. Um, I know, I, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier. I just want to throw it in there that we always, uh, a rule of thumb for my guys, at least we tell them. Uh, when the pumps, after the pumps, uh, the fluid going into the contact tower, have that temperature 10 degrees hotter than the gas coming in. And uh, that's, you, you know, yeah, that helps with you know, the cooling down uh, that you were mentioned earlier when the condensate falls out in the contact tower. 
I don't know if we uh, mentioned that earlier, but just a quick fun fact, I guess. Uh, that's what we always tell our guys, keep that fluid temperature about 10 degrees hotter than actually the gas coming into the tower. And you don't have that real cooling effect of bringing the gas down and condensate fallout. Um, but I mean, yeah, you, I mean, you hit all the, the points uh, really with the, the water loss in the contact tower. Uh, you is, know, the hotter, oh, go ahead. Uh, I mean, is it the same thing as a TG where you have to increase circulation rate? on a naming plant or is, I know you're not removing water, but there might be a tendency of, uh, you're a better, uh, I guess, more absorption onto it. So is it having to work harder? Do you actually have to increase circulation rates to the summer? Uh, we, or go ahead, Chris. No, theoretically, no. Um, the, the absorption for the CO2, like I said, unless you get to that temperature so high that it's just going to stop absorbing, um, then that, that's the only issue with it. The, um, Technically, as you boil the water out of it, you have more aiming, you have more absorption capacity, um, but you're hurting the plant because if you're aiming concentration for like DEA, 25%, if you boil your water out and you get up to like 35%, then you're increasing the viscosity of that liquid because now it's more aiming, it's a lot thicker. So then your, your pumps are working physically harder to pump it. Um, your, your filters are probably going to clog faster or show a higher differential because of just that, that thicker, um, liquid pumping through them. So it, it can cause other problems, um, with that. It doesn't, it kind of, it can wear stuff out. It, but that, that's an operational thing. You really shouldn't let your, I mean, let it get to where it's a noticeable increase. Your water makeup should be making up that, that difference in there. Um, but then you have to be careful. You do lose some amine as well. So if you're only making up with water, then your concentration may actually get too low. And then you kind of have the reverse problem where you're, you know, you're down to like 5% concentration or something because nobody was paying attention and they just keep pumping more water in. Yeah. Well, then, um, so on the TG system and the amine system, is there any adjustments on the burner side, like temperature, maintaining temperatures? You know, you got higher circulation. So does that mean? I guess you have to make the adjustments to manage the temperature, right, on the TG? Uh, it just needs to be able to keep up. So, I mean, if, if you're already at max with your reboiler, then you're going to find that you, you know, you can't turn up higher. Most of the, the reboilers are sized for the pumps, um, but some of the sizing, the pump's definitely bigger than the reboiler can technically handle. So, you know, the reboiler running at max may not be enough to... Um, to handle the circulation rate that you need on a, on a uh, glycol dehydrator. Okay. All right. Is there anything else y'all wanted to add to the aiming plants? All right. All right. So the next one that we were looking at was a uh, natural gas liquid recovery or BTU reduction. So it's not just recovery methods. It's also the BTU reduction. So we got three sets right here. Uh, JT systems where we're going to be kind of focusing on today, but you do have mechanical refrigeration, cryogenic, but, we wanted to go into uh, natural gas uh, liquid recovery on the GT side and BTE reduction. But Chris, can you kind of go through what that means and what, what these charts are actually entailing? Yeah, so the, the main point is hydrocarbon dew point. So what is the temperature at which hydrocarbons will start to condense in your gas stream? So the, you know, if you, if you have real lean gas, and that's, that's normally not a problem, your hydrocarbon dew point on a, a real lean gas, we got like, you know, 90 plus percent methane is probably going to be down to like 10 degrees, maybe, maybe negative 10 or something if it's, if it's lean enough. Um, but a lot of these shell plays are a lot richer gas. So some of that gas, it's, it's so rich that the hydrocarbon dew point is whatever the temperature is coming out of the wellhead. So any degree of cooling will cause liquid to start falling out. And, you know, different components have, have different condensation temperatures um, because it is a mixture. It doesn't really work that way. It doesn't like as soon as you hit the temperature, all the, all the butane falls out or something um, it, because it is just a, a mixture of it. You slowly, you take out some of the heavies, but they take some of the light ends with them. Um, but basically, if you cross that, you know, we have an example of a simple phase diagram here. If you cross that temperature line, then you're going to have liquid creation in there, which is the whole point of NGO recovery. Cool it down enough, um, either cryogenically or refrigeration, some way to do self-refrigeration with a JT or mechanical refrigeration with a uh, MRU. Um, you want to get cold enough to recover that. Um, but the, um, 
you know, being able to get that cold is kind of dependent on what your inlet temperature is. So uh, the basic idea is, you know, can you, can you pre-cool some of that to, to help aid in your, your NGO recovery process? So, you know, making sure your temperature isn't 120 coming into your, your NGO recovery process is, is pretty important um, just to make sure that you can get to the low end temperature that you're trying to reach. Now the, um, all right. So when it, it heats up, is there a, like a rule of thumb, you know, every 20 degrees, it doubles the amount of water saturation that uh, could be in it. I mean, if you keep heating it up, will there more, more propane, butane, pentane, the, all the heaviers, will they actually start, uh, I guess, can the gas hold more in a uh, gas form? It like can, um, but it is dependent on the composition of the gas. So, um, you know, if you, if you were to have, you know, gas stream coming out of the well and it's someone that's condensing, it's going down like hundred degrees and you're seeing some liquid fall out and then you go through a line heater and you heat it back up again. Um, you can definitely have a lot of that flash back depending on how hot you're, you're heating it back up again. Some of it isn't going to just stay a liquid. Once you get some of the, like the real heavies out, like your octanes or something, um, once they're out of the gas phase, they're going to stay out of the gas phase because they're not, they're not going to get hot enough to jump back because they'd have to get back up to like 200 degrees before they actually vaporize back. Um, so you, it, it does, it is sort of like a capacity thing, similar kind of to water where the hotter it is, the more it can hold. Um, but really it just depends on what in, what's in your liquid that you're vaporizing out of it. So if your, your liquids have a bunch of real light ends in there, if you get it hot enough, it'll start to basically stabilize the liquid um, by cooking the lighter ends mm -hmm. out of it, um, which then that can take some of the heaviers with the, your, your heptanes, octanes, um, hexanes and stuff that, that'll raise your BTU of the gas. Okay. Let's go on to the, um... all right. So this is uh... The picture on the bottom right is the um, JT system. It's our standard two million a day package that we got. But let's let's go into the different ways of uh, achieving liquid recovery and BT reduction, and kind of get into the focus on um, how do the operators, midstream companies, what do they need to be looking out for? Yeah. So with the JT, it's a self refrigeration process. So what it's doing is it wants to. Uh, take a pressure drop and use that pressure drop to get cold. Um, so that that available pressure drop um, and your available inlet temperature are going to dictate how cold you can get that cold separator, separator with just a straight JT unit. So if you want to get colder, you either need more pressure or you need to lower your inlet temperature. And depending on what your inlet temperature is, it, it can be a lot easier to, to lower that inlet temperature than it can be to raise the pressure. So if your you know, inlet temperature is 120 degrees, then you know, that's a great application for an ambient cooler that's just gonna need you know, fan cooler um, or a non-powered one that they can, they can cool that gas down to something closer to ambient um, and you know, that 20 degree savings versus getting another 20 degrees uh, of cooling from pressure, you're gonna need 150, 200 PSI increase in your discharge pressure. So, uh, or your, your inlet pressure for the system. So it may be a lot easier to put a fan cooler out to drop that 20 degrees than it is to increase 200 more PSI to get the same cooling effect from it. Especially if you're already at like 1200 PSI, you're not gonna be able to go to 1400 PSI. Um, all your pop-offs will start leaking before you even get there. And nobody likes to be that close to their uh, maximum allowable working pressures. Um, so, you know, pre-cooling beforehand can, can definitely help out with that. Cause you really don't have it's either one or the other. You're not going to make the JT work any better um, without lower inlet temperature or, uh, or higher inlet pressure versus like a mechanical refrigeration unit where if you have a high inlet, you just need to turn up your refrigeration and hope you have the capacity in your refrigeration system to, to get you where you want. Cryogenic plant kind of combo with both where they, they're using the pressure drop through the turbo expander, um, but they also do have a lot of mechanical refrigeration. So whatever you can do to decrease that inlet temperature is just going to save you on your, uh, your refrigeration cost. So refrigeration can be pretty efficient, but I mean, it's not more efficient than an air cooler. Um, if you can get away with one, uh, to just knock off some of that inlet temperature coming in there. Um, but yeah, that's the, you know, the inlet temperature makes a, a big difference on NGO recovery. Eric, I know you've seen that like on our fuel gas kids, there's a small JTs on them, you know, when they, that coolers bypassed, and we're coming in at 120, you know, we're not making nearly as much liquid. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, the cooler, I mean, it, it even an like ambient cooler, it, it helps a, a lot just to cool the gas down just a little bit. Uh, it helps. And 
like you were saying, it, in my experience, it's a lot easier to cool off the gas than to raise the pressure. Usually what the pressure is, what the, what the pressure is in a lot of the cases, you know. Um, so to cool cool the gas with a cooler, uh, you know, like an RJT systems, uh, some, some have it, some don't, the liquid to gas heat exchanger uh, or gas to liquid heat exchanger where our cold set dumps into the heat exchanger and, and pre-cools before we get to the, uh, our choke. Um, to, to me, it's just a, a heck of a lot easier to cool the gas you know, by adding a, a heat exchanger or adding a cooler, uh, then it has to, you know, change the pressure that's coming into you. So, to, like, during the summer, do you, um, do the service guys actually have to take a higher pressure drop, like, and start adjusting the JT to hit a, the cold temperature and the separator? Uh, it, it's up to the client. Sometimes, you know, we'll talk to the client because they, you know, they want the cold separator, say, at negative 20 or zero degrees and be like, well, you know, your gas coming into us is 140. That's, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can right now. Uh, we can drop you down if you want to lose, you know, outlet pressure. And, you know, they're like, yeah, go ahead. You know, we need more fallout or like, uh, well, no, you know, we need that pressure. We don't want to go lower than that. What, what else can we do? Okay, well, you know, let's add a cooler. Let's add, you know, another gas to liquid heat exchanger. Uh, we got to cool the gas down. Right. Now, now on that, um, the other question that we got from a client is if you're having to take um, to cool it down, it, does that affect methanol injection rates? So it definitely will. I mean, the colder you get, the higher the methanol injection that you're going to need to. Um, I mean, you can counteract that somewhat with, with dehydration. If you can, um, if there's any improvement that you can on your, your water content coming in, uh, the lower it is, the less likely you are to freeze up, the, the more you can kind of work back your, your methanol injection. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely getting colder, you know, is, is going to require more methanol injection. Like, you know, if we're getting down to 20 degrees, um, and just because we're trying to meet like a hydrocarbon dew point for pipeline or something versus getting down to negative 10 for, you know, an NGO recovery type application, it's definitely a big jump in, in methanol. Um, but I mean, that kind of implies that you're also recovering a lot more liquid. So you definitely should be getting your money back. Um, and some of your methanol back too. Um, it was in all the extra liquids that you're, that you're making, uh, through that, that increase in, or that, that lower temperature that you're able to recover. But yeah, even, even on the fuel gas systems, when we recover, you know, maybe we only need to get to 20 degrees um, to, to make, you know, good quality fuel gas for the, for the engines. And that's usually sufficient for a lot of compressor engines to just be able to get that. But if we can get to negative 10, and even though a lot of times on the fuel gas, we don't recover the liquids, we just send it back to like a low pressure separator. Mm -hmm. The extra liquids that are, that stay liquid, that don't flash back to gas in the, um, in the NGLs that we've recovered, uh, and that, can, that can be a pretty good increase in your, in your liquid oil production. So, you know, that extra 10, 20 degrees that we can get on that inlet may make you a few more barrels a day uh, of oil production off, off of a fuel gasket that doesn't even recover the NGLs that's just sending it all back to a, a normal separator that's just recovering it, whatever liquid that happens to stay liquid. So, I mean, that, that little bit of increase can, can be a big um, improvement. And also, I mean, if, if the gas is really that rich coming off of a, like the discharge of a compressor at 120 or so, I mean, if you can just cool it down ambiently, um, 20 degrees, you can get pretty good liquid recovery. Um, you know, that, then that's stable oil that you're not gonna have to stabilize. It can sit in a tank. It's not gonna, you know, vaporize because you recovered it barely above ambient. So it's not like it's gonna, uh, you know, cook off extra vapors in your tank. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get liquid recovery uh, just from having a cooler out there, you know, just enough. And sometimes, you know, your pipeline says, you know, you're not allowed to do, you know, BTU or like active liquid recovery, like you can't put a JT or something out there, you can't put a refrigeration system. Um, but if you're worried about being too hot on something, I mean, if you can cool it down just to 100 degrees, you can you can make quite a bit of, a bit of liquid on some locations, which can also you know help out other things for that, that liquid doesn't end up cooling down a pipeline, it decreases the amount of pigging that you're having to do, uh, decreases you know the corrosion on the pipeline because you don't have a liquid flow going through there. So, I mean, if you can recover that liquid in the beginning on the well pad uh, where you have that kind of infrastructure instead of just, you know, letting it get recovered in the pipeline as, as condensate and, you know, trying to pick it through the system, um, you can, you know, you, you're, 
it's more more controlled of the system. You're not going to end up slugging stuff down the line because you actively recovered it uh, earlier, and so it's not right. ending up in places it's not really supposed to. Right. Well, and that y'all yeah, keep uh, mentioning compressors, so uh, this actually transitions pretty well into this. So this is the heat impact on compressors. Now that that's something that uh, Gorka, I'd like for you to kind of kick off on. Um, what are your what do you see what your guys are focusing i know we got a lot of fcs on gas gathering facilities artificial lift so getting out there for the fuel gas for degrading a compressor can you kind of walk us through what y'all have to experience well, with, well I, I really like our fcs is it's a well, i think what we call uh, the frankenstein of uh, the company it's got a little bit of everything to it well you're biased you can't say you like them I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and they're very simple yeah. um uh, but I'll just walk you like through the FCS, all, all that it does uh, for yeah. the compressors and why why they are so good. Um, and I'm not saying our FCS is you know top of the line, but all the the parts that helps out the compressors. Um, you know, you hit, uh, you, you go in, you have your uh, up in the top left, I guess there, uh, the ambient cooling system. It hits the cooler and you know it it cools down the gas. Um, Again, that's what we were talking about the, this whole, mm -hmm. the whole time is cooling down the gas. Um, so we have that. We also have bypasses on it. So in cooler nights, say in West Texas, because, you know, West Texas, it might be 95 degrees, you know, midday or early morning and late at night, it's, you know, 50 degrees. And it's just West Texas for you. South Texas, uh, not as big of a drop, but uh, you can always bypass the cooler in the winters. You bypass the cooler. And I mean, your gas is still cool. Mm -hmm. um, but then from there, you go to our PDS system uh, on the unit and it dries the gas before it goes to our choke. Uh, that helps eliminate some of the methanol uh, injection. You, you know, you're drying your gas before you take a choke. You're not freezing up. Uh, go through your uh, uh, heat exchangers to your choke valve. Uh, that's where you take your pressure drop. Then you have all your majority uh, of your fallout right there in the cold set. Um, you know, like I was mentioned earlier, uh, to get uh, you know even cooler. Uh, in one case, we took the cold set drain and we ran a uh, gas to liquid heat exchanger using what we were draining out of the cold set just to cool the gas even more. Uh, and I think that was just for a few months in the summer where we just we we're trying to get it cooler to get the cold set down. Uh, but then from your cold set, you run it back to your JT. Uh, I'm not saying not your JC, your heat exchangers. Uh, and then, the, well, in the one picture, we do have the secondary choke up top there. Uh, and then it goes out and uh, into your compressor. And, you know, it knocks out a lot of stuff. And, you know, you hardly ever see problems uh, with, with, with the system. And the compressors run a lot cleaner. Uh, it's, you know, and in my opinion, uh, why, why wouldn't you? have each one of these pieces of equipment, maybe not our piece of equipment, but something of this sort to help well, uh, with the fuel gas for the compressor. So you got the fuel gas for the compressor. Everything kind of goes through a big Joe, then little Joe back into it. So I mean, what, what are you seeing on the composition, Chris? You do a lot of the simulations and you work with Caterpillar on a lot of the engines. So how do you walk through? What are the issues that we're seeing? So when, especially in like richer gas areas, any cooling typically will make liquid so once you once you've compressed the gas you're um the the higher the pressure the the less liquid it can hold similar to water content um the as you as you increase in pressure you don't have to get as cold to recover the same amount of uh, ngls and liquids out of the gas um, but what that means is then when you compress it, you're going to pressure that up. You're going to run through the after cooler that's built into the compressor. There's no separator though. All those interstage scrubbers are just in between the stages. There's no after stage scrubber on a compressor, um, or at least most of the ones you'll ever see. Um, so that gas comes out at high pressure. It's been cooled a bit um, through the after cooler on the system, but they're only really designed to output 120 degrees when it's 100 degrees outside. Like this is what they're rated for. They're not meant to get you like five degrees of ambient. They're meant to get you like 20 degrees of ambient. Um, so you have this, this high pressure, hot gas that's basically fully saturated with, with liquids um, when you have that, that real high BTU gas. And so any cooling is going to make liquids in there. So if you can keep that, that gas hot and you can run it through the, your system, it'll leave your location. You won't make any liquids. But when you try to run it for fuel gas through a big Joe regulator that's going to take a pressure drop, as soon as you get cooling, you're going to have liquid fall out. 
Um, so if you can pre-cool any of that, then at least you'll get some of that liquid out beforehand, mm -hmm. before it starts going through those regulators, um, which is less than the likely of hydrate formation is to reduce the methanol that you need in there. Um, because that, you know, that liquid slamming through into those, those fuel gas separators, if that's all you have is like a big Joe, little Joe and a fuel gas separator, then um, you can definitely overwhelm those pretty quickly if you have real hot gas coming in. But if you can kind of pre-cool it in there, um, it'll definitely help out on, um, on how much liquid you, that separator is going to get slammed with. Uh, also, if you can if you can cool any of that out of there, then it's not going to be falling out in the pipes leading up to that stuff. So sometimes people, you know, they don't they don't even have the fuel gas separator set up on the location. They just let like little fuel scrubbers handle it either on the compressor or on the the glycol unit or the burner or whatever. You use those little fuel pods, and then they'll have their regulators there. Well, as soon as, you know, you may end up with a bunch of uh, liquid that's cooling out of that gas as it travels down your pipe rack all the way over to your compressors. And then all of a sudden, you know, turn a new compressor on that's been idle for a while, just sucks all that liquid straight through that fuel line, overwhelms that little fuel pod, and then it's in your fuel system. So, you know, managing those temperatures is really critical to making sure you don't have hydrocarbon dew point issues. Um, but for fuel gases, it's pretty important, especially with a richer gas application, it makes a bigger difference as to where you're taking your pressure drops, um, you know, and how you're, you're dealing with that, that cooling on there. Well, what, uh, I know you mentioned a number of times to our uh, clients, they were like, um, their after coolers aren't working as properly, or they just haven't bypassed altogether. I mean, so I guess, what are the tips on that? You got the summer months happening, um, I guess automatic louvers, making sure that they're actually working properly. Yeah, and the, the biggest issue we see is the it's that in-between time. It says we're starting to get into summer when it's constantly hot. You know, it's time to just, just like leave the louvers open. Um, just let it, let it cool the way it's supposed to, um, you know, don't, don't try to, you know, keep it artificially hot. Some, some people just aren't allowed to remove liquids. Like they're, you're not supposed to do anything that removes liquids. I mean, the, the after cooler and a compressor, it's built into the unit, like let it cool it down and recover it. Cause some of the pipeline regulations, um, some of the pipeline contracts are not allowed to, uh, the pipeline wants all those liquids so they can sell them. Um, but, but yeah, anything, I mean, that goes, the, the heat uh, coming off the compressor can affect a bunch of things down the line. Um, if it's going into an amine plant, that increased heat is going to suck the water out of the plant. Dehydration is going to make it work harder. And compressors are the typical place we see the heat being introduced ahead of the production equipment. Um, now, we've definitely seen some hot wells. Uh, we, you know, that we've seen, you know, there's equal for wells that output 160, 180 degrees um, worth of, you know, gas coming off, off of that. And that, that can be difficult too, um, especially as you try to separate, you know, separating 180, you're not going to get a lot of the liquids out of there. And as soon as it starts cooling more, that liquid starts to fall out in places after the separator, which, which isn't ideal. Um, a story about compressors uh, for as far as inlet temperatures coming into them. Um, we had a client that, you know, they, they got a compressor out there. We were doing fuel gas for it. Well, the compressor company was having issues getting the, um, the contractual volume that they were supposed to. The client's saying, hey, this, you know, this compressor is supposed to move 7 million. You're, you're barely moving five. You're, I mean, you're at four and a half right now. Um, and they're, they're looking at us with fuel gas saying your fuel gas isn't good enough to run my compressor harder. Um, but come to find out the gas is coming in at 160 degrees. So the gas is so hot coming in that when it's going through the interstages and it's going through those scrubbers and getting separated out, they were liquefying a huge chunk of the, mm -hmm. the gas stream just because so much of it was just liquid in vapor form coming in there. So it, I mean, you can't, you can't blame the compressor because, you know, compressor is compressing everything it can. It just happens to be turning a bunch of it into liquid. So a compressor that should be moving 7 million is now only moving 5 million because of just that increased temperature. So, I mean, what's, what's the best solution uh, to, to be able to move that more gas? We'll put a cooler ahead of the compressor, cool it down, separate that liquid. And then you're just only sending stuff that's going to stay a gas through the compressor. And so then you can move more gas through it. Um, that it's a pretty big cooler to be able to do that. It's also low pressure, which is going to increase your cost there. But um, that's an interesting issue for having high temperatures that, that I hadn't seen before until about two years ago, um, as far as like, you know, something that was derating a compressor that, that wasn't fuel gas. Right. Let's go on to the next one. So the impact on instrumentation lines. So this could be instrumentation lines, fuel lines. Um, so I guess, uh, Eric, kind of, I mean, your guys have to chew on this a lot, I mean, mm -hmm. so kind of give us uh, a bloopers reel of what you've seen out and what how, how have y'all fixed it? 
Yeah, so uh, a lot of times when we see the fallout in the instrument, instrumentation lines, it's, it's real rich gas, real rich gas, and uh, there's no knockout or anything to catch it before, and it'll be in our supply gas to uh, either a level controller or a dump, and we'll catch it in in the regulator. Uh, in, in the regulators, we're just pulling it down, say a low pressure followed by a high, uh, I'm sorry, high pressure followed by a low pressure regulator, and a little low pressure regulator's got the little drains on it. Well, you know, just it's a you know what we tell our guys when you go up there, you know, open the drain, see what you have, and you'll just have you know like you open the water hose, and it's just condensate falling out of there. And, uh, you know, if you don't catch that in time, you know, it'll get into your pilots of your level controllers and it, it will mess them up. Um, maybe not at first, you, you know, you might, but eventually they're going to wear down the seals and whatnot. And our timer boxes, <clears throat> the solenoids are electronic. They'll get in there and screw them up. Um, we've seen it so far deep as after like a level controller, it's gotten into the, the dump valves and uh, has messed up the dump valves. You need know, you hit it and you have, or you take off the supply line and it's just condensate coming out of the dump valve. Really? But, uh, oh yeah, yeah, oh. With, with the real rich gas, yeah. Um, but how we, we try to fix it, or we, we have fixed it, it's been working out for us uh, so far. Uh, at first, you know, oh, well, let me back up. When you get condensate in there, you need to change out everything. You have the regulators, your pressure gauges, it's not going to be long before your pressure gauges no longer read the correct pressure. Um, so if you find, uh, you know, it's always in there and it's full, switch those, switch those things out. Um, how we caught it uh, before, we haven't really stopped it, uh, but we, we, we caught it before the regulators will put a, a little knockout chamber um, in front of the regulators or in between the regulators, the high pressure and the low pressure. We, we tried different sorts, you know, different areas mm -hmm. to see where, where we're getting the fallout, majority of the fallout in the, in the instrumentation lines. Um, and we've gone on some of our units so far, we'll have so much fallout, we'll take uh, fuel pots that, that we have in the yard that we're not currently using, and we'll put that on the instrumentation line. And, uh, you know, we, they have the automatic shutdown. If that fuel pot gets too high, it shuts down instrumentation gas. Uh, just to protect the regulators and the, the, mm -hmm. the pilots and the timer boxes and the dump valves. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's a, a real thing to catch a lot of condensate in the regulators. And if it's a continuously problem, find some way to catch it before it messes up your instrumentation. Well, yeah, uh, and pulling from, and that goes to like, you know, don't, don't pull fuel gas right after a compressor. You know, pull yes. it, if the, if the gas is cooling on your location, pull it from the coolest spot. Um, you, your, your regulators are going to drop that pressure down. So you may have more impact, but you're going to have a lot less, uh, cooling effect as if you, if you, you know, taking a 120, dropping it down, it ultimately gets down like 60 degrees or something. Um, you're going to have a much more liquid fallout than if it's hundred degrees and then it cools down and then you, you set your regulators right to where, you know, you still get down maybe 60, you're still gonna have less liquid fallout that way. So if you get that real hot gas and you start running through regulators, you're going to see a lot more liquid fallout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and add your instrumentation after all the equipment, not before. I've seen, I've seen it out there just like, oh, this is the only spot or this is the most convenient spot to add, you know, where we pull supply gas. And it's before uh, and not just on uh, hot gas, you know, untreated gas and you pull it and like, when that, that's just waiting for a disaster to happen. Well, like on the tips and tricks, so it's about to be summer months, uh, heat, uh, so does the heat actually affect uh, the instrumentation in itself, not just fall out what's in the line, but like, is there a certain instrumentation that you got to protect from um, direct UV contact or things that y'all have seen in the fail, uh, fail out in the field? I mean, most things mm -hmm. are rated for, for higher temperatures and they're going through the regulators. So they're not going to be like, you know, 120 degree supply gas running into things mm -hmm. um it, it's really the the liquids going through them that'll like buna rubber will absorb hydrocarbon you get a condensate it's basically gasoline uh, going in there it gets in the rubber seals makes them expand um you know potentially leaks or something or they start yeah. ripping um, especially in, especially in your kimrate pumps yeah kimrate pump and condensate they eat those the o-rings uh in the, the camera pumps, they will eat them up, and then you have a busted pump, and you can't figure out why when it's only been on there for a month. Uh, if condensate gets into the camera pump, it'll mess that camera pump up. All right, so it's not really the temperature in itself, but it's the, the fallout of condensate fallout. that really fell 
the, the liquids really hurt everything. Yeah. And yeah. it's, I mean, setting your regulator so you're not getting too cold. Um, so you're staging your pressure drop or it's a little more even, um, or you're, you know, you're staging it and then it drops and it goes through a but supply pot, then you take your low pressure. Don't just go high, low supply pot, you know, go like high supply pot. And then, you know, go from like 90 to 30 or whatever. Um, you know, that, that can help out, you know, staging it out. Right. So, you know, you can see that fallout in weird spots. Um, Cause if you drop too low, then you're just not going to see anything um, on the separation and then it cools down then it starts to fall out even more. Uh, but yeah, it's really just, you know, making sure that those liquids you're cooling or heating is in the right spots so that you don't have it, um, the liquid fallout. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the next one. So the impact on color metric tubes. Now this is a big thing just because it's a uh, it's funny to hear y'all's conversations and then everyone arguing, well, I got a Drager, I got a Sensodyne, I got a ray tube, and then everyone's looking at each other. So kind of kind of go into this. Uh Chris, you want to kick us off on uh, the tubes? Yeah, so this is a real common way to measure, you know, CO2, H2S, water content, um, a lot of water content tubes. We go through a lot of those. Mm -hmm. um, but it, they, so what it is, it's pulling a sample of the gas through this little foam that's got a chemical on it. It's creating some sort of reaction with whatever you're trying to measure. Well, heat and the temperature of that reaction affects that reaction. Now, different brands, it's all different, but there mm -hmm. should be, if you have one of those, these two packs, if it's a Ray, it's Sensodyne, Gas Tech, whatever, um, that little paper that comes with it should have a temperature correction factor for it. And what we see is a lot of people have never heard that before, especially on the water tubes, what the, uh, the temperature can actually affect the reading on it. And the, the way yeah. these are made, the, the ideal reading, that the exact reading it's supposed to be, is usually at a, um, like a, like a standard temperature, like 70 degrees or something. Um, but South Texas, it's, the gas is never 70 degrees. So there's usually some sort of correction factor that needs to be done on these tubes to get them to read exactly what they're supposed to. So for this particular table, I think this came from Sensodyne. Um, it looks like their reaction was like right at 50 degrees is where it was supposed to be. Um, but if you, let's say you pull a five and so on this chart, you see there's a five um, water content on there. Uh, your reading of, on the tube reading is a five. If it's a hundred degree gas, that five is actually a two and a half. So the, um, the reading is a lot lower when you get into the real high temperatures. So if, there, if the gas is real hot, the gas is 120 degrees, it, you, when you pull it, you read a seven, it's not actually a seven. You know, it could be, it could be a five or a four, depending on the correction factor for it. And they're all different. The sensodynes, I think, are the, the highest correction factor. The, the rays definitely have a little bit of a correction factor on them. Um, but typically what it, what it is, is the gas is warmer the um the actual reading is lower now mm -hmm. the same thing that also applies to co2 um i believe it applies to the h2s tubes as well they have the correction factor in there as well um, but the water content ones are the ones that we see the most yeah. impact on um for what, what they're actually getting pulled and what the what the real reading is once you do the correction factor on them now there is a correction factor i know uh, when we were pulling it it's not just uh, h2o or water content tubes uh, co2 h2s they all have a temperature correction on them as well so um but uh for your guys uh, eric I mean, what a when you're going out there and explaining to clients operators pumper gaugers uh even the, the pipeline guys um i mean how, how do you all come into agreement of you know if it's intolerance or not. Well, sometimes we just don't agree, but um, other times, <laughs> uh, other times, you know, we'll, we'll get a, a medium, like, like Chris said, there's all kind of tubes out there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, say four of us show up, not all four of us are going to have the same type of tubes. Um, but it, usually, you know, you'll, a lot of the times we'll have to explain, hey, the correctional factor, you know, we're, we're at 100 degrees, you know, there, there's a correctional factor. Mm -hmm. It might not be as big as mine, but I'm also pulling, you know, less than you or higher than you either way. And uh, we kind of get on agreements. Majority of the times it's like, okay, well, you know, we'll wait till, you know, it's cooler, you know, in a week, you know, we'll come mid early morning and pull a tube when the, you know, the gas is, 85, 90 degrees instead of 104, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon, something yeah. like that. Um, so they always keep that in mind, you know, that, uh, you know, it, usually three, four o'clock is probably not the best time to pull a tube 
because of this correctional factor. You know, it's 104. Well, then then you got to pull out your little slip, like Chris was saying, and be like, okay, now I need to multiply it, you know, by 0.65. And uh, oh, yeah, they are under spec. But, uh, you know, mid morning, uh, I think, uh, I think you said, Chris, that 50 degrees was it's when it started correctional factor. Yeah, that's for the sensodyne. The rays are, um, it, it's a little higher. The rays are like it? 70 degrees. Yeah. And, yeah, every, and then, everything above 70 degrees it will give you a high reading. Right. Yeah. And that's no, what, that's what 50, we use. Oh yeah, 73. 73. That's what we use uh, is the ray tubes. So that's the way, uh, you know, the guys know, like, hey, you know, yeah, we might be pulling high. The temperature of the gas is high. So, you know, we might pull to seven. No, we're not really a seven. You know, we might be more of a three or, you know, whatever that comes out to be. But um, it, it's always something to keep in mind. And it is, it is a hard conversation to have sometimes. You know, when uh, a lot of people, you know, they're told when, when you pull a tube, any color is water when you're pulling a water tube. And that's, that's just, that's incorrect. You know, I mean, this correctional factor, you have, you know, an injection that might be causing right. the tubes to misread also. So, um, again, I mean, it, it's sometimes it's a hard conversation and it, you could get into, I wouldn't say heated arguments, good arguments, never heated, but um, it, it's just a conversation you, you have to have. So I, I like it. It was a heat impact. So when he said heated argument, it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> heat impact on color metric tubes. So yeah, temperatures do affect uh, color metric tubes. We're finding out there's a lot of people out there that don't know that every time you buy those little package, there's a slip inside of it that has a correction table. So take a look at it next time that you'll pull out. Uh, all right. So when to utilize coolers? Uh, we're starting to run out of time. So Chris, if you can like the power, non-power, kind of quickly brief on uh, where the coolers are and what they are. Yeah, so the, the non-powered coolers are a great option for low volumes. So um, there's kind of like a velocity that you want to keep through there. So lower pressures will kind of derate that, that max volume that it can do. Um, but like the one that's pictured there, that one's good for like 3 million mm -hmm. uh, worth of gas. And it, depending on the conditions that it's in, if it's in a good windy area, um, it'd be able to, to handle more than like, let's say, East Texas, where there's not that much airflow. Um, and, but because you're, they're non-powered, you do have to take into account the environmental aspects of it. So if you're in a good windy area, those, they can work great. If you, know, you move it down the road into a bunch of trees, then it's not going to work so well. Um, but they, because they have no utilities, no power requirements, they, they are a really good option if you can use them. Um, for powered coolers, you either have electric or you have gas powered. So gas powered can run on natural gas, they have a little engine on them um, that is going to have more um, maintenance requirements because it does have an engine on it. Um, you have oil changes and maintenance and overhauls and stuff that you'll have to do for them. Um, the electric ones, you got to be able to run power to them so that, you know, that can be difficult if you can't get power. But the electric ones, like the electric ones that we sell, um, have outlet temperature uh, uh, probes on them that you can control on the on uh, the on unit computer. So you can set your outlet temperature to exactly what you want to it to be. The powered mm -hmm. cooler, the gas powered coolers with the engines, um, they usually don't have such fine temperature control. A lot of times you have to put like a temperature bypass around them to be able to like really fine tune a temperature. But with the electric ones, you can set it exactly, and it'll just ramp those those little fans up and down as needed. So it can give you really fine temperature control on on the unit, and uh, and because it's you're setting a temperature, it'll ramp up and down um, as needed, which can save you some power. Um, if you don't need it, it can turn off at nighttime and then turn back on, um, which is a little more complicated with the gas powered ones. And then for the really and they, so these coolers are good for five million, three million up. Mm -hmm. Um, up to maybe 24 million um, for like the standard electric ones that we have. You can always go bigger. You can put two of them out there, but like the biggest standalone cooler, then they make some pretty big ones, probably be like 40 million at high pressure that, that you'd be able to do before you're starting to like stack up multiple and running them in parallel. Um, and then bigger than that, if, if you need to cool it down or you want to get below ambient, then you're going to have to go to a refrigerated cooler. So that's going to be use a ref mechanical refrigerated, uh, refrigeration system, like a water cooler unit or something and a heat exchanger um, to, to cool that gas down. And so that's what you're going to need if, if a, like forced air isn't an option. If you're like in the swamps of Louisiana and there's just absolutely no airflow, you may have to go to like a refrigerated system um, just because the ambient conditions and the gas being, or the air 
air, just the ambient air being so freaking humid that um, you're just not going to be able to really, you know, work a powered cooler like you'd, like you'd expect mm-hmm. in other areas. Well, and that's, uh, so on the next one, you kind of put a quick diagram of the highest recommended areas that you would prefer cooling. So uh, if you can quickly kind of go into the scenarios of uh, cooler one, two, three, and four, and you know, how do they help? Yeah, so these these are kind of like optional areas, places to put coolers if you're seeing excessive heat. So, you know, where we have the well, coming from the well, we have our initial um, uh, separator. This particular one is actually low pressure coming in. So 7 million, 30 PSI, 140 degrees. Um, Pre-cooling that before the separator is always good. If you have a cooler, you probably want a separator after it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because even if you don't, if you're not making hydrocarbons, you'll probably make some water. Um, so you, you probably want something after it just to make sure that you're not going to have it, unless you're like between like a TG and a JT, um, then that may not be so much of an issue. Um, but most likely you're going to want a separator after the cooler just to catch those liquids that you're actually condensing. So the first place would be right, you know, at the very beginning of things, cooling down the entire process stream. Um, if it, if it is very hot so that everything, you know, is, is cooler going down. Now, if you have a compressor, like in this example, we have a compressor, we have another cooler right after the compressor. Now that's to take it from that 120 down to maybe hundred degrees, something more reasonable, um, for, for the application. And we want to do that again, right before separation. Um, usually more of like an actual separator, not like a filter, um, coalescing filter may get overwhelmed depending on how much liquids you're actually condensing out of the gas. So um, usually you want like a separator ahead of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have coalesc- uh, coalescing filter. And then um, another place you often see coolers after amine plants, but not all of them have them built into the system um, where you have a cooler right after the amine tower. And then you have a scrubber after that cooler as well. That way you can kind of recover some of your, uh, your water uh, from the aiming system. Like I said, you have a heated reaction, the aiming plant, it's going to warm the gas up. It's 100 degrees coming in the plant, it's probably going to be 120 coming out um, or higher. So it depends on how much you're actually removing from there. But um, being able to like cool that down, recover that water, um, also mm-hmm. just put less work on the next thing. Usually it's dehydration. Here we have a TG unit. So if you have that, you know, that 120 versus 100 degrees is going to be, you know, double the work on that TG unit. And because you have the amine plant that's making it warm, it's going to be completely saturated because it sucked all that water right out of the amine. Mm-hmm. Um, so a cooler, you know, after the amine plant, before the, the, the dehy, or maybe after the dehy before a, a JT unit or some sort of NGO recovery, TGs can also warm up the gas as well. Like uh, Eric was saying, a lot of times we like to have the glycol warmer than the gas coming in. That way we don't have hydrocarbon fallout, but that's also going to warm up the gas. Um, you, maybe not a lot, but you know, if, you, if, it, if it is hot coming out of the TG and you can cool it down, you're going to see uh, improved recovery on the, uh, the NGL systems, the JT unit or mechanical refrigeration. Just to point out real fast, Chris, like... Uh... You were saying earlier, like the, the place where you put your cooler, you know, you don't want to put it in the trees. Another place you don't want to put it is like where the exhaust of the compressor is blowing right on yeah. it or next to the burner of the amine plant because they, they're not going to do anything. Yeah. It, it's, you know, you're working in the middle of an amine plant. It's already hot. And so you put a cooler next to it. The cooler's not going to do anything at all. So, it, again, just to... Uh, emphasize, I guess you say, the placements of coolers are, are very important. You can't just throw one out there and expect it to work yeah. when you put it on the exhaust of the compressor. Yeah. And it's a little more piping, then that's great. It's more cooling, right? You like, you take a piping a hundred feet away to the corner of the pad, you put your cooler, run it back a hundred feet. I mean, that's just going to get you a little extra cooling there. There you go. Well, and that, uh, Gorka, that kind of goes into, so these are your case studies that you put in. So kind of, uh, quickly kind of go through the, these three scenarios and, you know, what, what were they? Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, that, that top scenario there, that's uh, two uh, 48 inch of our PDS systems. And uh, it, it, the gas was hot. I mean, like uh, you, when you touch the piping, you know, it almost you know, put a burn mark on you. It, it was hot stuff. It was about every two weeks we were going out and uh, putting multiple drums in. And when I say multiple, I'm like 12 drums. And that was like one of them was empty and half of them was already empty. And we sized these things for like 45 days. That's how hot the gas had gotten. Uh, we, we put in these, uh, these two coolers here and uh, I dropped, uh, I'd say 100 degrees. It might have dropped cooler than that. 
And uh, I want to say then after that, once a month, we were going out there putting like four to five drums in it. It, it dropped just just the temperature in that gas dropping that much. The Envir dry uh, usage just it dropped off like that. Um, so the guys were quite happy with that. They yeah. didn't have to run out there every two Fridays to uh, go fill it up. Um, but um, let's see the second case there, the team. So that was the one that when we put in front of a glycol unit that wasn't able to handle the, um, like the summertime, it just, it couldn't meet spec anymore. Mm, so it was mm -hmm. um, down South. So it, yeah, just the, they'd be like out of spec seven, eight pounds or something just because they couldn't turn the pumps up anymore. Right. And so it just wasn't able to, to dehydrate like it was supposed to it would cool it down. Um, they had a compressor that just was always 140. I don't, I don't know why, but it was just always really hot. Mm -hmm. um and so it was just it needed a way to cool it down that way the the dehyde could do what it was supposed to yeah 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 i do remember that now yeah yeah it was a little little undersized and they had it cranked up pretty much as running as much as possible and adding a little cooler just bring uh i'm not sure what how far we brought it down but just dropping it down by the little bit uh they met i think right under spec and they were happy uh, oh and then the, yeah the fcs uh, I mean, that's what I kind of hit on earlier. Adding that cooler, I mean, it helps with the fallout with a JT. Um, you know, we, we come sometimes in at 160, 140 degrees, and then that cooler, it helps the JT drop out more, or the, the choke valve drop out more into the cold separator, and you get more fallout, and uh, compressor engines run better. Well, we, we should have done a, a bloopers reel, because we've seen a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, the resourceful way of where they're adding pipe into a like a ditch like a natural ditch that's already there and they're filling the ditch full of water and they're trying to cool it off that way and they're having to pump more water in every single day oh yeah you actually you see that uh more often than i thought i would see it uh <laughs> you know you know we have pet turtles every month you go out to your uh gas to liquid heat exchanger which is your pond and you have your little pet turtle that comes in and visits you and whatnot <laughs> but uh yeah, we actually have that. I mean, like, there's, there's one way to cool down the gas. I don't know how uh, how much it actually does cool down, but it, we we actually uh, we were on one location a few years back, and they actually uh, it was a uh, it was an ambient cooler at an angle, but they had no roof, so there was I mean that radiant heat coming from the sun mm -hmm. was actually warming it up. They were heating it up. It was coming in at 120 degrees into the fan, and it was leaving like at 132, 135 out of it. So they were actually just heating it up. Um, so they're yeah, one of our clients. They I think they doubled the volume to the cooler, so it wasn't cooling. It was one of the non-powered ones, uh -huh. and so it just wasn't cooling as much as it. So they put a sprinkler on it. They just like aimed a sprinkler at the cooler to to cool it down. So it was just dribbling water all over the thing constantly. Well, yeah, Which, uh, the, I mean it works, but <laughs> it's just like yeah, it's nice to keep a sprinkler on all the time. Yeah, I've seen another one where it didn't have a roof, like you were saying, Cameron. But um, someone's idea was to wrap it in a tarp to get the heat from on it and i was like well, there's no wind flow through it now so <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if this is going to work exactly but dis let's go dissipating that heat at all then yeah i was like hey you know what let, let, let's try it you know i'm up for new ideas well next time actually that would be a funner thing uh actually tell your team uh, start taking pictures of uh, resourceful ideas out there so we can have not a bloopers reel but you know what everyone's trying to accomplish out there thinking outside the box because they they understand that heat the heat is an issue uh you are going into several months and it does have an impact on their operation so they're trying the best they can out there and then hopefully this webinar is gonna help as much as possible let them have get some ideas of how they can um stop that mitigate a lot of those risks so we're going to wrap up this, uh, but if you're interested in being a webinar speaker or know someone that uh, would like uh, to be a good fit, please reach out to tori.bellagura at crosssystems.net. Um, the one thing that we like about our company is that we constantly love feedback. So please, uh, you're going to get a survey via email after this. Tell us how we can tailor and improve the upcoming webinar. So the whole point of this is to share the information, get our uh, industry as educated as possible on uh, best standard practices that we have. So please fill that out. Uh, another one is uh, let us know if you would like, this is considered a professional development hour. So if you need those hours, let us know. So that way we can ship you a certificate if you joined us today. 
Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, you want to run simulations, you're having some heat issues, uh, BTU reduction, fallouts, dehydrators are not working, not performing, please reach out to uh, reach out to me, reach out to Tori.Belagura, or you can just go to our website, uh, click on it, and then we can get that information over to you. So, uh, Gorka, Smithson, thank you for everything, for joining us today. Um, spending the time with us and everyone that's joined us on the webinar. Thank you uh, for joining us. If you do have any questions or follow-ups driving home, you start thinking some other ideas that you have, please reach out to us so that we can get those questions answered. All right. We all take care, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm.